Welcome to this uh, DCSP 25th anniversary event on gender, bioweapons and COVID-19. So the goal of this panel discussion will be to connect dots uh, between uh, these topics and we count on every one of you to, to contribute um, your thoughts and with your comments. Um, I'm very excited to see such a high number of, of people joining this debate, uh, but I must unfortunately say up front that I would kindly like to ask you to switch off your cameras and to stay uh, muted during uh, the debate. And this is due to GDPR concerns. Uh, but of course, this does not mean at all that we don't want you to participate, as I've said. So please use the chat box below uh, that you can find as a Zoom function to put your comments throughout the discussion and also, of course, ask questions and we will have them on board. Should you wish uh, to say who you are, where you work with, then please note this and we will be happy then to read out loud who is asking the question. Otherwise, feel also free to ask anonymous questions. So um, this little message up front. And now uh, let me introduce um, this uh, DCSP 25th anniversary panel to you. And I must say that I'm really delighted to have uh, um, our panelists here. And I would like to start with welcoming uh, Dr. Nancy Connell from John Hopkins Center for Health Security. And I must say that uh, Nancy has just this incredible track record of research and, and, and activities she did that reading all of them would be really a, a very, very long list. But let me uh, tell you that she's a microbial geneticist by training. So she really does know what she's talking about. And uh, she obtained her PhD from Harvard University in microbial genetics. And uh, Nancy has recently um, participated in a, in a number of very interesting research projects on COVID-19, uh, one on antibody tests and very recent one also on the public's, public's role in a COVID-19 vaccination. So uh, should you have specific questions on that, I'm sure uh, Nancy will be very happy to answer. And uh, so, yeah, again, uh, Nancy, welcome uh, to, to the GCSP and to this panel. And now let me turn to my two colleagues uh, from UNIDIR. And I would like to take this opportunity to say that actually UNIDIR was founded 40 years ago and is celebrating its 40th anniversary. So for us at the GCSP, 25 of GC, uh, years of GCSP means also 25 years of very fruitful uh, collaboration between the two institutions. So uh, please uh, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Renata Dalacqua and Dr. James Revel uh, to the panel. So both of them uh, have been involved in a number of research activities. Renata is leading the gender and disarmament program at UNIDIR. And I'm always uh, following her activities because she's really trying to analyze so many different topics and applying this, this gender lens and, and giving a gender perspective to, to topics like um, yeah, the Biological Weapons Convention, also uh, chemical uh, weapons. And, and now recently, I know Renata is also conducting research on gender approaches to cybersecurity. So a very interesting activity is coming up. And I think uh, I'm very safe to say uh, uh, that James is really knowing the Biological Weapons Convention inside out because he uh, already did his PhD on this topic. Um, so uh, James is a researcher within a UNIDIR's Weapons of Mass Destruction and other strategic weapons programs. And as I say, uh, researching on uh, various topics, chemical biological weapons regimes, and also recently a very interesting study on the compliance and enforcement across uh, weapons of mass destruction regimes that I would like to recommend to anyone wondering, well, how are these um, uh, regimes actually being complied with and implemented? And um, the person leading this fantastic panel is my colleague at the GCSP, Richard Lennon. Uh, Richard joined the GCSP recently as an executive in residence. And I must say that it's always great uh, to have Richard on board for discussions in arms control and disarmament, because uh, I think here again, I'm safe to say that, that Richard has seen the world of disarmament from basically all perspectives as an Australian diplomat, as an UN official at UNODA, and also leading the Biological Weapons Convention Implementation Support Unit, and more recently as an NGO activist. So really uh, having seen 
it all from different perspective. So, um, Richard, I would basically now uh, hand over to you and wish all our participants a very fruitful uh, discussions. Okay, thanks, Dominica, and uh, welcome everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're calling in from. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be um, facilitating this discussion uh, on what is an interesting subject or set of subjects. Thank you all very much for joining us. I'm so sure everyone's probably had enough uh, Zoom uh, events by now, but um, the end is in sight. We hope uh, perhaps we'll be able to have in-person discussions uh, before too long in the new year. Anyway, though, when I first uh, was approached to, to chair this event, um, Dominica described it, as she just described to you now, um, about, as connecting the dots, connecting the dots between um, bioweapons, gender, COVID-19. Okay. Um, it reminded me a little bit of that game Sometimes you can play on Wikipedia. I don't know if anyone's done this, where you have two totally unrelated subjects and you have to have a competition to see who can get from them from one subject to the other just by clicking on links in Wikipedia articles. So uh, which, which topics can be connected to others. But as it happens, gender, bioweapons and COVID are quite closely connected as we're going to see uh, and in a very interesting way. And uh, why are we talking about it? Well, it's topical, of course, COVID is topical. But uh, just today, if you looked at the BBC News website, there's an article about COVID and gender saying uh, there's a concern um, expressed by the deputy head of UN Women that the COVID-19 pandemic has set back women's equality by 25 years, uh, with women taking on more and more unpaid work uh, as a result of uh, or greater share of unpaid work uh, as a result of the pandemic and the, the socioeconomic effects that have rippled all through the world, both in developed countries and developing countries. So obviously there's some very uh, um, interesting and perhaps concerning um, developments there that's connecting gender to, to COVID. Uh, gender is also connected to the BWC as we're going to see. But I thought what we'd do is we'd start off um, today's discussion by just asking um, uh, two of our panelists to explain a little bit about what we mean by gender when we're talking about uh, gender in connection with these kinds of global issues. Uh, what's the difference between gender and sex and so on. So perhaps if I could start with you, Nancy, and you just, you know, what is this all about? Give us, give us the primer. Thanks. Uh, sure. Um, uh, the scientist on the panel, I think I'll start by talking about uh, the actual definition of the word sex. And um, there are really three components to thinking about uh, whether an organism or a cell or a person is of one sex or the other, um, or intersex, right? So there are three forms, male, female, and intersex. And those forms of sex are defined by three components. The, uh, the uh, chromosome complement, X, XY, XX, um, X, <laughs> there are variations in, in the number and, uh, and construction of the, of the sex chromosomes. The second are the reproductive tissues, testes or ovaries. And the third component um, are the complement of, uh, of hormones, of, of uh, steroid, uh, sexually defined steroid hormones. You know them all, testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen. So, um, so those three, the combination of those three components is what defines sex. I think I'll refer um, the question, the second part of the question to my colleague Renata, who can give us a good outline of the definition of gender and how the, and then we can see how those two differ. Renata, over to you. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Thank you, Richard. Thanks uh, GCSP for this event and, and this kind invitation. Um, so as Dominica was saying, I lead UNIDIR's Gender and Disarmament Program. And I always think it's important that we start by explaining what do we mean by gender. Um, I think that's, uh, that's a conversation that a lot of the times gets, um, gender gets confused with as a synonym for women. And that's not how uh, it should be because gender refers to a broader social construct um, of ideas and behaviors and characteristics that are considered as a norm for either a woman or a man or a, a non-binary person in a specific 
time and place. So gender norms, they affect everyone and they are not, uh, and they are, are, they can change. They can, um, they are not the same everywhere. They are contextually defined. And that's what makes our conversation very interesting because um, it interacts with culture in many ways and it interacts, uh, sex and gender also interact in some, um, uh, in, in some unexpected ways, uh, as um, Nancy was saying, sex, uh, it's the biological definition, gender, the social construct. And there are times where they come at and they have an interplay, interplay. for instance, pain. Um, it's an example of um, exhibits biological sex difference and also incorporates social cultural components of how symptoms are reported by women and men and how, let's say, a doctor will react when a woman is explaining certain symptoms and when a man is explaining certain symptoms. So just to say, um, it's a, an interesting conversation because it's a very complex one. And it has relevance to arms control and disarmament. And this is also a second step of my, of my job. First is to explain that gender relates to everyone and that's a social construct. And then it's to bring the specific dimension to arms control and disarmament. Um, should I go into that or should we go back to, to Nancy, Richard? Nancy, do you want to um, just uh, pick up a thread there or? Um... No, I think we can go on. I think, you know, having defined the difference between sex and gender is a good uh, grounding for um, subsequent discussion. Just sex is the biological determinants and gender is the social construct. Right, okay. Well, Renata, yes, please go ahead and tell us how it, uh, how it connects to disarmament. And I mean, I think there's kind of two essential channels that you, uh, that you do your research on, is that right? Yes, so uh, when we talk about gender in arms control and disarmament, there are usually two ways that these uh, topics have been brought together. The first one refers to participation, who gets to speak in arms control and disarmament, and we know there is a chronic uh, problem of gender imbalance. This is a field that has been uh, dominated by men for many, many years and where women's participation in comparison to other areas of diplomacy is lagging behind. So um, the way we are, I mean, we have done research about this at UNIDIR. We have a, a publication called Still Behind the Curve, where we surveyed uh, lists of participants over the past four decades for arms control and disarmament. And the numbers that we found um, is that back in the 80s, women were less than 10% of participants in arms control and disarmament. And now they are usually around a third of diplomats attending arms control and disarmament, which, as I said, is behind other areas of diplomacy, let's say human rights, social affairs, uh, or even climate. Um, the other aspect of gender in arms control and disarmament is to look at how gender perspectives can be applied to the substance of the discussion. So let's say um, in the case of biological weapons, if there are differences in the impacts of um, biological weapons in men and women and, and how we can uh, incorporate that knowledge into let's say assistance strategies. This is one way of, of looking at it uh, from the perspective of, of biological weapons. But um, this has been, I mean, there are, uh, I'm sure there are other ways also to connect uh, gender and arms control. I would say uh, building gender expertise within multilateral processes and multilateral arms control and disarmament structures could definitely be a third one. Uh, but just to say that mostly what we have seen is gender conversations focused on the issue of participation, which is a very important one and um, also on the issue of gendered impacts. And UNIDIR has done research um, on both aspects. And if I can say, uh, I just had a look at the issue of women's participation in the Biological Weapons Convention meeting, the last one in 2019. And what I found is exactly uh, fits the pattern that we have seen in other arms control and disarmament fora, where women are represented at a level of 35% of the delegates. 
Um, but when you look at leadership position, this number drops a lot. So we, in the last meeting of state parties of the Biological Weapons Convention in 2019, uh, only 20% of heads of delegations were women. And when you look at who gets to speak, also out of the national statements, 22% uh, were delivered by women. So we have this um, situation where women's voices are not uh, commonly heard in arms control and disarmament. And if I may connect uh, with COVID, uh, we have seen the same uh, with COVID. It has uh, highlighted gendered impacts and it has also highlighted um, uh, underrepresentation of women in, in COVID task forces, for instance. I was just reading a paper analyzing, I think, uh, COVID task forces in 87 countries. 85% of the task forces are um, mainly comprised by men. 11% uh, of the task forces have majority of women and only 4% of task forces are gender balanced. And this is in contrast, in contrast with the public health uh, um, workforce where women are the ma majority of uh, nurses and res uh, first, first respondents to this uh, public health crisis. And they are underrepresented in the decision-making related to COVID-19 response, for instance. Right, and that's a pattern, of course, that we see across a lot of different policy areas. But let's, COVID is the issue at the moment, so let's stay with that. Um, of these two kind of uh, categories of, of discussion of gender issues that you've just talked about, Renata, I'd like to pick up the second one first, that is the gendered impacts and gender as an analytical uh, approach. And so if we can go uh, back to you, Nancy, and then we'll hear from Jamie, uh, if Nancy, if you could tell us a little bit about the sort of gendered impacts and gendered analysis of the COVID um, pandemic, uh, and perhaps also some more general public health points. And then Jamie's going to uh, tell us more specifically about BWC assistance and the gendered analysis of, of that. Um, just before we turn to you though, Nancy, I'd just like to remind everyone, please, you don't need to wait until we finish talking to submit your questions. You can type them out in the chat panel uh, as we go along, as soon as you think of them. If one of us says something you think is wrong or uh, controversial or needs to be uh, um, amplified, just type it out then and there before you forget. Uh, and that way we can, we can go through and find lots of interesting things to, to keep the discussion going. Um, if you, as Dominica said, if you want to, I, if you want to be identified as the person asking the question, please just write your name at the beginning of the question. So, you know, hi, I'm Richard, I want to ask, blah, blah, blah. Um, that way we know you don't want to stay anonymous. Um, so with that little reminder, uh, Nancy. Sure. Thank you. Um, let's start by talking about uh, a little bit about the disease itself, about COVID-19 and its virus, SARS-CoV-2, which I'll just abbreviate as SARS-2. So we all know and are quite worried about, you know, the, the heterogeneity of this disease, asymptomatic versus symptomatic, severe versus mild. Um, are there sequelae or not? You know, who, who, which of the, which of the survivors of the infection actually proceeds to, um, to the long, to the so-called long hauler or multiple sequelae that, that stay for months and months and will, it can be quite debilitating. So I think one of the things as opposed to flu, one of the things about this disease that has thrown us for such a loop really is the heterogeneity of response. But one aspect of this disease that is not heterogeneic is the, uh, is the effect on, uh, between males and females. And this is across countries in all of those countries that do report disaggregated data. We know that there is almost you know, some, between 1.5 and twofold increase in severity and death, mortality, risk of mortality for males. Um, and this is standard and cannot really be uh, explained away by cultural or maybe gender uh, related events like uh, increase in smoking or exposure by being outside more or you know, other kinds of characteristics that might suggest that males are being uh, exposed more to the disease. So there really is a biological factor to the fact that there's a higher risk of severe disease and death um, for males in this disease. So what that means is that we need to study why females have a lesser risk. 
And if we understand some of those mechanisms, we can then apply that information to designing better vaccines, better therapeutics, more effective medical countermeasures of various kinds. So let me say right from the start that this is not true only of SARS, uh, of SARS-2, of COVID-19. We um, Similar data were derived from studies with SARS-1 in 2003 and 2004 um, and in MERS, um, the other coronavirus diseases, um, uh, epidemics that, that we've dealt with. And in fact, viral infections across the board are generally um, uh, generally showed um, significant sexual differences, um, differences based on biological sex. Um, what are they? Mostly uh, deep inside the immune response, really very complex um, uh, kind of generalities uh, that um, shouldn't be the topic of a discussion here, except to say that, that uh, females appear to have stronger and more effective antibody responses, of course, the downside of that is means that they can also have uh, an over uh, an over inflammatory sometimes an over inflammatory response and therefore may be subject to uh, adverse events and so forth, so forth uh, after infection or after after vaccination. But generally, females mount a greater antibody response to viral infections, and and that's well known and studied in more diseases than just coronavirus infections. There are some T cell differences. This is the other part. Remember that the immune system has an antibody response and a T cell response. And it's a bit more complicated with T cells. We understand a bit less, but we know that, um, that the degree of, dis of dysregulation or inappropriate T cell responses is a bit is higher in males than in females. We know that in coronaviruses. So um, the idea that, that this is a, a sort of immediate opportunity to study the differences um, in large numbers of people across the, across the world, um, uh, male and female in response to this virus means that we have the opportunity now to think about um, ways to design, as I said before, therapeutics and vaccines in, um, for these kinds of infections. And we have all been saying, this is not our, this will not be our last rodeo with a with a with a uh, with a viral epidemic and or pandemic and the interacting the intersection the intersecting factors of age and sex and race and other kinds of um, uh, components understanding these factors is critical to understanding both the biological and social and um, socio cultural factors that are um, that lead to this heterogeneity of of covid that is making it so difficult to control this disease So, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of the biological background. Uh, can you add something on the on the uh, social economic sure. or gendered? Uh, right. So on the other on the other side, then thinking, um, you know, if we take uh, a sort of uh, uh, perusal of the role of men and women in these um, in the response, so thinking about the public health response as Renata and uh, has already said that it's the public health workforce is dominated by women. Um, we have some examples from uh, Ebola, for example, that um, again, another viral disease, uh, that, that women were exposed more because of their roles, for example, in, um, in burial practices. And so, uh, and in fact, one might be startled to realize that men realize this and then uh, actually, uh, uh, would sometimes um, engage in practices that would restrict their exposure to, to burial practices or to other kinds of um, exposure to disease. But there's no question that across, across the world, um, women are, the, are often the caregivers and are um, more often exposed to, um, exposed to infection in that regard. Okay, well, that's, um, that's actually a good point to, to switch over to Jamie, um, who's going to tell us a little about, uh, to look at the, some parallel um, experiences in the BWC and assistance provisions under Article 7. Jamie, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Richard, and thank you for the opportunity to be able to join this event. Um, I think in, in addition to some of the points Nancy raised, I think there are a couple of other factors that are important to think about in terms of gendered effect of disease. Um, these include things such as uh, access to information, access to credible information may not be even um, across genders. 
Similarly, there may be cultural gender difference in healthcare engagement and health seeking um, behavior as a response to public health measures as well. And then issues with, with uh, stigmatization and discrimination as well. Putting these together, the, these issues are, are not specific to the BWC. In fact, th they, these challenges extend far beyond the Biological Weapons Convention. And I think there are limits to, to what a disarmament treaty can do. Um, but, but neither are they irrelevant to the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, under Article 7 of the BWC, there is an expectation that in the event of a violation of the Convention, states parties will provide support or assistance to those exposed to danger as a result of a violation. And I think it's generally accepted this should be provided in a timely manner. This is one article which I think has had some useful discussion over the course of the past decade or so through intersessional process meetings. And just to give you one example of this, there's a Russian Federation and UK working paper which draws attention to the need for a clear awareness of local cultural aspects and the ability uh, to consider this in, in response. I think the, the way I sort of make the way we've, we've uh, made the link in the past is that this awareness of cultural and gendered aspects uh, can have real implications. It's not just a normative factor, there are practical practical implications of this, and I'll, I'll touch upon um, three of these briefly, but particularly in the area of uh, communication and in response strategies as part of an assistance measure. So. Um, it, it, it seems logical that in the event of a violation of the convention, you, you'd um, biological weapons were used, you'd want to make sure that communication strategy effectively reaches all parts of the population. But as we see from looking at past disease outbreaks, there's often um, a lack of access uh, for, uh, for women in some situations where they won't have that information. And that's a real problem. If 80% of your primary caregivers are women but do not have access to key credible information, then you have a serious issue there. Um, and I think it's also taking into account that any biological weapons attack would likely be accompanied by mis- and disinformation. I think you could potentially have a real issue there. Issues around stigmatization also need to be taken into consideration in public health messaging. And there's evidence to suggest that they could be particularly acute for women as well. So there's another factor there. Um, and then more generally making uh, wider assistance and public health responses. I think it's important to make sure that these don't exacerbate exi ex existing um, gender inequalities or remain blind to, to gendered expectations. There are cases from past research where you can see how, for example, laws designed to prevent the spread of Ebola meant that women either risked not fulfilling their duties as a caregiver, which caused significant dist distress to them and their family members, or risk spreading the disease if they did fulfill their role as a, as a quote, good, good caregiver or wife and mother. So you can see how some of the decisions can actually have a significant bearing and increase tensions and pressure upon women in these situations. Um, yeah, and I think it's also there are factors in, in understanding health seeking behavior, how people respond, which could be gender specific and having a better understanding of these can lead to more effective provision of assistance in the event of a, a biological weapons attack or indeed in the event of a natural disease outbreak. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it there, Richard, but I'm happy to follow up the examples and things as you wish. We'll, we'll come back to you, don't worry. Um, no, well, well, actually, Jamie, why not do that now? If you just give us a couple of, of examples, uh, and then what I want to do is, is to link this back to, to the other of um, Renata's kind of avenues of, of analysis and to look at participation and decision-making. Uh, the, the point on, on uh, different caregiver roles, I think, is particularly acute in, case, in the case of uh, Ebola, as was discussed before. But I mean, if if there is an expectation that women will be in the, the front frontline responses, but also involved in washing bodies as part of burial practices, um, this is highlighted as one explanation for the initially disproportionate number of female Ebola cases in the 2014-2016 Ebola outbreak. Um, that there are also sort of the, this situation you see quite often um, in relation to access to information. So, uh, and it's sort of almost women's control over their public health. So in some cases you can see that uh, women may require permission from male relatives or elders or the wider community to seek healthcare, which is clearly can have implications for an assistance strategy. 
Stigmatization as well can also dis, dis, um, dissuade people from seeking medical assistance or reporting cases. And you, you can see how stigmatization is problematic for both men and women, but it can be particularly acute for women where the consequences can be almost ostracization or can significantly affect participation in community and, and family life. So there are all these factors and there are a number of wider implications from COVID as well in terms of economic disparity, uh, childcare responsibilities, and then uh, wider problems with lockdown. But th these are not unique to the challenges faced in the BWC. It's not something which is BWC specific, but uh, provision of assistance and response, response strategies could usefully take some of these ideas into consideration moving forward. Okay, thanks. Well, so what I'd, uh, I mean, we've seen now uh, there are some aspects of COVID, for example, that depend on sex. Uh, Nancy explained the different uh, biological response to the virus uh, between men and women. Um, there's also these um, socioeconomic factors we, we've discussed from a gendered, uh, gendered uh, angle where we're looking at the different impact on different groups, uh, socio, social factors, burial practices as well as an example that's come up very much. But what I'd like to try to do now is, because there always comes a point in these uh, discussions about gender uh, when you get to the sort of so what question, which is, okay, it's different. Uh, you have this situation, you have these factors, but so what? I mean, do we need to do something about them? If we do, what do we need to do about them? Uh, and this, I think, is where the link is comes back to participation. So we had the, uh, and decision making. So we had the example of, um, vast majority of healthcare workers being women, but the decisions being made by very uh, male dominated uh, groups. I think you did mention it, uh, Nancy, but I think maybe you will also want to tell us something about medical research and the imbalances there. Um, and then perhaps after Nancy's filled us in on that, Renata, we could come back to you to talk again about participation and decision making and what, you know, so what, what do we do about all this? But uh, to you first, Nancy, um, yeah. tell us what we should do. <laughs> For, um, so uh, there are different levels to discuss here, but just thinking about basic research and even going back to you know, research in, at, at the level of uh, inside the laboratory with cells, with cells that are generated from either male or female um, uh, sources, you know, from male mice or female mice or male humans or female humans, um, there are differences in how those cells behave. And the fact that, uh, that those differences were not regarded for the first 100 years of you know, molecular research really means that you know, we have actually pulled together data in ways that, um, that could have been valuable all along. I can say um, that in my 30 years in the laboratory, I always used uh, my and all my colleagues, we always used male animals for our experiments, infectious disease research, because they were not um, a subject to what are considered sort of hormonal differences, right? So if you use female mice, then you can't control the fact that they're moving in and out of estrus and, and there could be differences in the effects. And while that makes sense in, in uh, superficially thinking that, that there'll be this sort of more, be more a kind of a, a homogeneic response if you're looking at gene expression and so on for in whatever field. Um, in the past five years, people have now done, uh, performed experiments to show that there, it really doesn't matter. And if, it, if it's what, if that, that pooling together male and female mice and the data from that um, seems not to make a difference, um, either way, the, the, there's a movement now across the world um, to, to start uh, doing experiments in either male or female mice, but both. Um, and here's the reason. Um, one starts a series of experiments over 10 years, developing a drug, for example, uses only male mice or, and then only male um, uh, humans in, in preclinical and clinical trials and so on. The drugs are released and then uh, they're found to have adverse, uh, adverse events, side effects and so on, that are uh, 80% uh, affecting, uh, affecting women. So what that means is that the effects of these drugs, whatever they are, so I'm cardiology, any kind, any any area of physiology. We're not just talking about infectious disease here. Um, that these women, uh, women who experience side of adverse events uh, that weren't detected because 
mostly male cells and male animals and now male humans were used in preclinical work means that the drugs have to be taken off the market and reassessed for dose specific, dose, uh, for dose um, concerns and, and other kinds of effects that might be specific for women. So the push now is to start with looking at both male and female, um, both male and female derived um, uh, samples, cells, humans, animals, and so on from the very beginning of the work. And as you go along, you can start pooling them if you, could, if you find that there's no difference. So that's um, one level of, um, of research. But I should also say that um, jumping back to COVID now, that very few countries are reporting dis, what, what, what is known as disaggregated data. We don't know the difference. We have been able to measure epidemiological, you know, with epidemiology and so on, that there, that there is this 1.5 to twofold risk of death. But as far as, um, as more granular reporting from across the world on sex, gender, and COVID-19, these data I'm going to describe now are from um, a wonderful group, not the only group studying this, but Global Health 5050, which is an international organization looking at um, sex, gender, and COVID, that uh, only confirmed cases and deaths are, um, are that uh, only 50% of countries uh, across the world are, are uh, actually reporting disaggregated data for death and for confirmed cases. For testing other components of, of, of our efforts to follow this uh, pandemic, such as testing or confirming cases among healthcare workers or hospitalizations or hospital, hospitalizations that convert to ICU, intensive care um, admissions, the numbers are appalling. 4% of, of countries um, are reporting disaggregated data in this regard. So it's very difficult for us to follow um, the points at which these, uh, these differences are taking place as the disease progresses through, uh, through the, uh, its uh, victims. Um, and also as we evaluate our, our institutions um, in their response. Yeah, so it's, I mean, I, I find this fascinating as you, you're describing a, almost a kind of historical blind spot or black black yeah. spot in, in, in medical data going back centuries, probably. <laughs> Decades, yeah, it's, it's remarkable. It, it is remarkable, but it's, you know, you when you talk about the mice, I always think about Douglas Adams and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know if they consider the gendered aspects of creating the Earth as a scientific experiment. But uh, but it's you know your example of the mice is is very telling because if we 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 can also turn that around and just to to illustrate the fact that when we talk about gender, it's not just about women and the effects on women that you know men is a is exactly. gender and. And so you have this greater effect uh, of the virus on, on men. And yet, if we'd only studied women, you know, just to say purely if we had this all the other way around, uh, we wouldn't know that. And, right. uh, you know, so it's this kind of uh, failure to, to um, have an inclusive approach has these very practical outcomes. It's not just a matter of sort of getting 50-50 representation because that's sure. what we've started as a, as a policy goal. Um, but we've actually been handicapped by um, by failing to to study things to include gender in, in our appropriate in our studies, which uh, brings me to Renata. What what do we do about this? Yeah, so there is some uh, idea that. Um... Gender is kind of a luxury item. And then when you are in a public health crisis or in any other type of crisis, uh, you don't have time, you don't have, um, you don't have the luxury to <laughs> um, take into account gender. But this is a very misleading idea because as we are saying in this case and in many cases, it's actually a matter of life and death. And um, what Nancy has been describing, this kind of uh, the absence of women in a lot of uh, medical trials um, and the um, lack of disaggregated data is really a problem uh, when you want to make evidence-based uh, decisions, right? If you don't have the data, how are you going to be um, 
doing uh, uh, good decisions. So I think what, what is uh, really important is to make sure that we have uh, the numbers disaggregated by, by sex and age, and that we have um, more research about the gendered impacts of disease. Um, and when I talk about research, I'm, I'm not saying uh, only uh, quantitative or uh, only in the medical science field. I'm actually talking also about the qualitative aspect of uh, incorporating the voices of the people who are most affected by these issues. And then we would need actually a social, sciences appro social science approach as well. Um, what COVID has shown is that disease traced the line of existing inequalities and uh, the people most uh, that will be most affected are the one most at risk. And I think we need to consider this uh, in research and also in public health uh, response. We actually wrote, uh, so, uh, I mean, it's great to be in this panel with Nancy and Jamie, because we've been writing about this. And the thing that it needs three of us, I actually needed four to write missing links, and it needs a lot <laughs> of people to be writing on this topic. It's because it's very much cross-disciplinary, right? Uh, you won't have one, I mean, maybe this person exists, but I've never met anyone that uh, congregates <laughs> all these this disciplines and all this knowledge. So it's very much collaborative work that we need here. But we actually wrote um, a short piece when COVID came, when COVID hit, me and Jamie on, on I think it's on, you need your website. Um, uh, there is no uh, gen gender neutral pan pandemic. And in that, pa in that piece, we actually outlined, so we were thinking, I mean, what would a gender lens means? Uh, what would be a gender approach to public health emergency? And we listed some questions that um, decision makers could consider when uh, developing public health uh, emergency response. And it is to think about what are the different needs and priorities of women and men in this context, in the context of the proposed uh, policy. Uh, what roles do women and men are most responsible for? As we were saying, uh, the role of uh, caring for the sick or the role of um, uh, burial practices, funerary practices that will lead them, that will lead one gender more exposed to pathogens than the other. Um, are there existing gender inequalities that may be exacerbated? Do women and men have equal access uh, to shape the outcomes, to influence policy development and decision making? Are the services and technologies of the policy uh, accessible to both men and women? Do follow-up protocols address the need of specific groups, let's say families with children, the elderly, persons with disabilities? Are systems in place to collect, track, and publish uh, relevant sex disaggregated data and statistics? And I think um, this may seem, I mean, uh, uh, this is not so hard to actually start to incorporate this in your policy making, and it will lead uh, to more effective results. So I think this is something very concrete that we can start to, to mainstream. And um, this goes for public health emergency, but can also be considered in, in, in the field of uh, arms control and disarmament. Um, how we've been saying about the biological weapons regime, I would even go a bit further saying, let's say um, the chemical weapons regime as well, they are associated not only with, um, they have very much, not only the arms control and disarmament, but they also have a role in um, promoting science and technical cooperation. And I think these are aspects that can be also incorporated in the um, technical cooperation and scientific promotion activities that are uh, that, that happen as part of the biological weapons regime or the chemical weapons regime for instance yeah well that's uh, thank you for making that link Renata because uh, what I'd like to do now is ask Jamie to perhaps explore I'm kind of ambushing him here because this wasn't in the plan but uh, <laughs> to to explore a little bit how that might happen in the BWC with respect to providing assistance or other aspects other obligations of the, of the regime but I'm as you were talking Renata I you know I was really considering this that when we talk about 
access uh, to decision making, when we talk about uh, participation and representation in, say, I mean, let's talk about the BWC, for example. Uh, and you mentioned some figures about the, the participation of women. Uh, I think 35% you said at the last uh, last meeting of states parties. Um, what I mean, what strikes me though, it's not just about numbers, is it? I mean, it's uh, it's more a qualitative sense. You, you need to include the people who the decisions are going to affect, or at least people who know um, what that involves. I'm thinking now about questions like social factors, burial practice, you know, the role of women. Um, so whatever policies you're adopting, uh, if you're adopting them in the blind, uh, because you don't know how they're going to play out in, in, the, in the village, in the town, the city, the, uh, where they're going to be put into to practice, I mean, you, you're going to end up with a less than optimal policy. Uh, that's maybe obvious, but I, I just wanted to get it clear in my own head, so I'm, I'm thinking out loud. Uh, Jamie, I mean, how, can you give us some ideas of how we might put this, uh, take this forward in the BWC? We have a review conference coming up next year and there's some opportunities to, to make some changes. What, what do you think? I, think? I think more generally there's potentially value in incorporating consideration of both sex and gender differences in syllabus and training programs related to chemical and biological protection and response. Um, and I think given that historically there's often been the case that biological weapons have been targeted at civilian populations, um, it, it's really about trying to bring gender into the discussion around um, the provision of assistance under Article 7. And to say this, this has been a useful area, it's been discussed quite a lot over the course of the last decade or so. Um, but trying to draw this out, particularly in terms of practical terms, practically in, in relation to the development and the delivery of public health messaging trying to put measures in place to at least stop pause to consider that before launching out a public health response. But also in, in the, the, the crafting of response measures, um, because I, I think we've all found a case that no one size will fit all. At least having some understanding, some consideration of gendered factors can actually be important in ensuring this is effective. And as, as pointed out before, I think to do this or at least build in ways to ensure this is taken into consideration in advance of any crisis. So I think that's also useful to consider. Uh, in, in terms of the review conference, I mean, there's, um, it, it's, it's an, it seems to be an area where potentially working papers on this could be drawn out and then traditional um, understandings could recognise the importance of this factor amongst a number of wider cultural factors as well moving forward. But I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks for ambushing me, Richard. Always happy to ambush any panellist, <laughs> um, as well as people uh, on the floor. Now, uh, we've got well, already a question coming in. I'd like to open up the floor and, and remind uh, everyone, please ask your questions. Just type them into the, the chat panel. You'll find the, the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and can I, uh, yeah, can I ask ahead. a question internally? Just, Renata, I'm curious about your data from the 2019 Biological Weapons Convention meetings and whether you distinguished between the meeting of the state's parties and the meeting of the experts and whether those ratios were different. Okay. Uh, I only have the number for the meeting of state's parties. Okay. What we have seen, and I would say um, that probably is the case for BWC as well, where civil society is participating. I don't know, maybe there is a, a greater rate of participation of civil society and academia in meeting of, of experts. Um, that would probably increase the gender balance because mm -hmm. uh, civil society participants tend to be, uh, most of the time civil society representatives attending arms control and disarmament are 50-50. The imbalance that we see is actually uh, in, in official delegations from, from members Right. Right. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Nancy. And um, just before we go to questions, um, there's an, several publications that have been mentioned um, by panelists uh, from publications from UniD. You'll find the links to them in the chat panel. And of course, if you can't get them there, uh, you'll find them also on UniD's uh, website. So uh, we've got a couple of questions already. I'll start. I'll start asking them. Um, it's open, open slather. Unless the question specifies a particular panelist, all three of you, please feel free to to answer the whole question or whichever aspect you you feel you can add something to. Uh, and also, you're free not to answer. Also, um, 
So first question we have uh, is talking about caregivers and uh, the gendered aspect of caregiving and caregivers. Uh, the ICRC apparently has recorded a rise in acts of violence against healthcare providers during the Ebola and the COVID-19 pandemics. Um, and uh, have any of you, the panelists, considered whether there's a gendered aspect to violence against healthcare providers? And should, if there is, I mean, should these considerations be uh, informing plans and responses for assistance in the BWC? Any thoughts on this, Renata? Yes, so uh, the data that we have is that women are 80% of nurse and midwives around the world. And uh, I haven't seen, and, and this seems to be really around the world. I don't know if there is a country where actually the majority of nurses are men. Um, but just to say there is a very clear gender pattern of engagement in this area. Both, in this, I'm talking about professionals, but at home also the, the people that uh, take care, care for the sick or care for the family are, are usually uh, women. So there is a very much uh, gendered aspect in that. I didn't know about these um, incidents of violence against healthcare providers. But I would assume there, I mean, there is a, a gender element that uh, should be considered as well. I don't know if any of the panelists already have um, uh, read or researched about this. Anyone? Jane? I mean, just, just a sort of historical note. I think in the case of the Ebola outbreak, there was healthcare workers who were actually attacked. And I think... Uh, seriously injured in certain places when they went out to rural communities because of mistrust and because of uh, misinformation that had spread in advance, which I think kind of reiterates the importance of making sure that you have a credible message and that actually is able to reach out to, to people. Um, so this doesn't really answer the question posed, so, uh, but yeah, just to follow up on that. Nancy. Yeah, I would add that um, I've recently been reading a lot about uh, uh, online um, online response to, to women versus men in both politics and um, since COVID began in public health expertise, epidemiologists and so on who are um, out there uh, on Facebook, sorry, you know, but on Facebook and Twitter and so on, um, <clears throat> commenting, offering their expertise and the, the violence with which uh, they're often attacked is, um, is remarkable. And I'm sorry that I can't give you numbers. It's just started, I just started reading about this yesterday, but they're out there. So there are people studying, um, there, are, there are people studying the, the difference in how um, women in politics and women in positions of um, decision-making in public health and other fields are um, being, um, you know, how, how their comments are being received in, in public for uh, such as social media, um, it's pretty remarkable that um, the kinds of, uh, of violent language that's used um, in social media against against women in these in these positions of uh, of authority. So. There's, um, I'm sure there are, there are studies on that, and um, the, the, of course, there's a lot of work being done on gender-based violence, um, something that a number of um, NGOs and of course governments too are working on here in Geneva and the arms trade treaty among other forums where there's a big focus on that. Um, I guess here with this question, we're looking at also a kind of double confounding factor in that, you know, an increase in violence against caregivers. Is this actually uh, an increase in gender-based violence because most of the caregivers are women or is it uh, an increase in violence against caregivers as caregivers, which um, disproportionately affects women because uh, the disproportionate number of caregivers. Uh, I don't know what the answer to that is. I'm not familiar myself with this uh, ICRC work. Um, if anyone uh, of the uh, participants wants to add something to that in the comments, uh, please do so. In the meantime, uh, I have another question. This is, this is a very curly one. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's about disarmament and arms control. Uh, it mentions that um, the, the points being made about socioeconomic dimensions of COVID-19 
uh, that the, the Lancet, which is a, a prestigious medical journal, recently said that we should be talking of uh, this event as a syndemic rather than a pandemic. Syndemic, uh, S Y N D E M I C. Uh, that because we're we're dealing with a number of interlinked factors that drive morbidity um, related to chronic diseases um, associated with poverty, which of course is is gendered in itself. Uh, and the, the the question for the panel is: uh, In your experience, um, are human security and inclusion considerations that these kind of you know broader uh, concepts of syndemic, I mean, systematic security, system security, being given the same weight as traditional state security in areas uh, such as disarmament and arms control? Great question. Um, who wants to tackle that? Jamie, that sounds like one for you, actually. I was just thinking, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> A simple answer. <laughs> Renata, can you expand on that? I mean, sorry. No, sorry. Jamie, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, often we're talking about disarmament treaties or created by states for states. So there is a certain dimension that these are often orientated towards national security rather, rather than human security. I mean, I think there are, there are glimpses by recognition of the importance of culture and things like that, which are perhaps beginning to change. But uh, no, I, I, I take the point in the comment. I think they are centrally focused on national security primarily. Yeah. Renato, something to add to that? Yeah, just reflecting that um, COVID has showed that military preparedness, it's not always enough to keep people safe. Uh, and I think that may put into question um, the way countries orient their countries and the international system orient their resources. Um, so, um, I mean, military security is important, but uh, we should also be looking at development as the person who asked the question about poverty issues. Um, education and human rights. So I think this could be an opportunity for uh, redefining security, actually. Um, the prospects for redefining of <laughs> other pandemics, I mean, I don't want to be, you know, uh, the, how do you say, the, the doom, the predictor of the doom, but I've been, I think we've all been reading that other pandemics may come also and become more frequent in the future after COVID. And so I think putting the public's well-being at the core of national security uh, would be a good outcome of this crisis. And when we actually write, I mean, I think every time that we are talking about gender and arms control and disarmament, we are actually advocating for thinking about the consequences that these have on people. And um, I think uh, this is very much in line with that. I think COVID has highlighted the, the gendered uh, aspects, the gender consequences of crisis, which is something that uh, we've been talking about. Um, the importance of uh, thinking about the people and, and the importance of uh, going beyond just military security to consider other aspects as well. Yeah, this is this is really interesting, Nancy. I mean, from the scientific perspective, I mean, from the perspective of the scientific community and as a scientist, do you see, I mean, the same opportunities that, that Renata just talked about that this this may result in some re reorientation of of national and international policy away from a sort of very militaristic view of security towards a more inclusive one? I completely do. I mean, I. I'll, I'll credit my colleagues at the uh, National, U.S. National Academies and the Board on Life Sciences with coming up with these with um, a way to see the changes in uh, in in the in acad in academics, scientific academics, in um, other kinds of you know in how the academy works in uh, social constructs, in public health, in uh, in you know medical response and emergency response, you know, across the board. And all of these, of course, feed into so-called national security. Um, uh, I'll, credit, uh, I'll credit them with, or all of us, with coming up um, with really three buckets of, of, of events. And so as we all experience COVID and it changes our lives completely, um, there are really three kinds of changes. One are, uh, you know, the realization of, of inequities or problems or, or holes that need to be filled that already existed and are now revealed, right? So the revelation of, of um, things that were, are of existing 
problems. The second is problems that we knew were there, but now are being amplified. So just to think, stay in the academy for a second and in medicine, an example of an amplification is that, you know, women are, in medical research, women are usually at the bench more than, than running and writing grants and so on. And so they can't go in to the bench and so they're home. And, um, you know, if there's a, if there's a, a couple with, you know, with, a, with bo both scientists, one's at the bench, one's not, the bench people stay home and take care of the children. And that's always, um, that's uh, usually 80%, uh, 75, 80% of that um, are women. So the, so the changes of the roles of professional women is um, across the board is, uh, as the BBC article this morning points out, is you know backed by 25%. So that's the second bucket. Is that here are these these existing problems that we've all been thinking about and trying to incorporate um, in at higher levels, and they're now being amplified. And the third bucket are brand new problems, brand new problems that nobody even realized were there yet that have been triggered. And so um, we like to, uh, I like to to think about things as we go through this pandemic and find that you know the entire nature of our lives has been uh, altered for every one of us on the planet um, that that each of the problems that we see can be put into one of these buckets the reveal the amplify and the trigger um, but you're, yeah you're optimistic though that this will this will lead to something some optimistic my my view is some things are optimistic some are not you know we're able to have this meeting for example because of the pandemic we might not have had this many people engaged i'm not sure what the numbers are out there we we can't see but um uh if this meeting had been held if this particular meeting had been held in person how many people would be there local if someone was in town you know hundreds of people can join in this discussion um in ways that i think we hadn't really appreciated before so there is that change of the kind of increased inclusivity with um, everything being, you know, remote now, everything being virtual. On the other hand, we always say that a lot of the work that gets done, certainly in at the conventions and so on, um, gets done in the back rooms and in the hallways and at coffee. So that those aspects of, um, of arms control and negotiation and interactions uh, among the states' parties um, will, will suffer. Anyway. Okay, I, I mean. Personally, I'm somewhat, if I can just abuse my uh, position as chair here and butt in with a, an opinion, uh, I'm somewhat optimistic that that, that things, uh, some lessons, positive lessons will be learned. And I think, uh, I mean, Jamie, <laughs> Jamie gave a quite um, damning one word answer as, as to whether these the broader human security considerations were being, you know, considered in, in arms control and disarmament. He said, no, I think that's, that's, uh, partly a joke, but um, partly a result of him working on weapons of mass destruction. Because in the in the area of conventional weapons, we do see, we have seen this uh, concept of human security gradually being more and more incorporated into our work, um, led by the, the big humanitarian oriented disarmament treaties like the Anti-Personal Mine Ban Convention, and the Convention on Cluster Munitions, which is just having its review conference this week. Um, and uh, to, perhaps also to some extent, the arms trade treaty is all driven by uh, humanitarian concerns and a sort of broader concept of, of human security, which doesn't necessarily mean that all the parties to those treaties fully uh, engage or endorse that, that approach, um, but it does show that it, it, it's an approach that, that has some traction and over the past two, two or three decades has, has, has made progress on broadening this, this idea of security. And I think, what are you know really going into extreme optimism now? Um, I'm uh, hoping that as we come out of this COVID pandemic, we'll see a bit of a resurgence in multilateralism and the need for you know properly considered collective international responses to deal with with crises or prepare for crises. Uh, and this will coincide nicely with the newest, uh, with the entry into force of the newest humanitarian oriented uh, disarmament treaty, which is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons which has just got its 50th ratification and is going to enter into force on the 22nd of January, 2021. Um, which of course, you know, for those of us like me who are, who are um, big supporters of that treaty, is terrific news, but it's also, I think, a very good moment uh, with, uh, with a new administration in the United States, for example, perhaps less hostile to multilateral cooperation. Um, 
but also the, the lessons of COVID saying, you know, these, these global level uh, problems can't just be left to, to national or regional squabbles. They really need a, a properly global response. So I'm, uh, that's, that's my optimistic hat. I'll take that off now and come back to reality. <laughs> have, we got, uh, have we got any more questions? I'm looking at the question just... panel. Yeah, go ahead, Jamie. Yeah, sorry, uh, just to sort of follow up on the slightly flippant answer before, I think, as, as you point out, your recent treaties have become more attentive to human security. And I think another factor is that there's increasing attention in both the Chemical and the Biological Weapons Convention to wider governance activities, which I think could slightly shape the focus and also create the sort of connection between the international down to the, the national and the local level and the individual, which I think is quite important. I think the BWC actually does this quite well, this convening capacity to bring together different stakeholder groups, which it's not necessarily going to result in a shift away from a traditional national security focus, but perhaps an expansion of, of other areas and issues as well, and work on capacity building assistance, which I think is important. That's that's true, I think. And yeah, Nancy, go ahead. I would agree that um, that there that there seems to be some small amount of traction in in these kinds of efforts on the margins of the BWC, for example, the possibility of some kind of scientific advisory mechanism. Not clear, you know, structure and, and scope and so on. But um, it's over the past, I would say, decade, it comes up more and more, and it seems maybe we're slowly moving in the direction of um, something similar to the kind of outreach and that OPCW has been so good at. Um, and uh, as well, uh, ethical guidelines, um, formerly known as codes of conduct, but now um, sort of reinterpreted as, a, as ethical guidelines that, that, are, that are being considered, I think, more, with more frequency and more interest um, and more commitment with the, by the states parties of the BWC. Richard, I also like yeah. to add more more positivity to this conversation. I think also a recent um, a develop a few develop a development that we have seen in the past couple of years has been um, more systematic approaches to gender in arms control and disarmament. And um, I think this is also something I'm seeing here, the question in the chat, what is needed for this shift towards uh, a, a different type of security to happen. I think that's very much part of this process. Um, the way that uh, we have seen countries supporting uh, gender, uh, the integration of gender perspectives in arms control and disarmament. Uh, we've also been uh, having a, a more uh, structured conversation inside the UN, let's say on our side with UN women. Um, the um, report actually, the Secretary General issues every year a report on women, peace and security. And this year, 2020, it actually mentions biological weapons. It mentions uh, our research, uh, Missing Links, as an important uh, contribution towards understanding um, gendered impacts in arms control and in, in specific the case of biological and chemical weapons. So we are seeing further integration uh, inside the UN. Also, we are seeing a lot of uh, goodwill on the part of some countries. And this is the work that we've been calling in, at UNIDIR connecting the dots, uh, bringing together, I mean, uh, we don't, uh, this everything that we've been discussing now, it doesn't happen in the vacuum. We've been talking about all the different interactions and we've been trying to um, consolidate a more structured approach towards bringing gender perspectives into arms control and, and disarmament. And we are happy to see several countries uh, supporting the approach. It starts with um, education, doesn't it? So it starts of, it starts with, with women being uh, uh, approaching parity in, um, in high school and colleges in exposure to, to, to um, science training, of course, to STEM and so on, but also to, um, in, in early diplomacy. And so I would just recommend the really wonderful Global South Youth Project of the ISU, that the ISU has, um, is now um, actually looking at its second class of young people in 50-50 parity that, that um, meet once a year, that, uh, sorry, meet um, around the, at the margins of the, uh, the MX and actually uh, think about science diplomacy. The inter, the inter, inter academy panel as well has a, has a strong program for both women um, and, 
and or young people, um, that is where the changes will take place, I think. The sooner that young people and the larger number of young people who, by the way, have, um, you know, the, the attitude towards young people to this business of gender is quite different um, from those of us who are over a certain age. So uh, there, there's a, a new view, I think, in what it means to be male and female among young people. And I think that will gradually start changing <clears throat> the, um, you know, the nature of the, of the approach as we go along. It's slow, but it's happening. It's slow, but it's happening. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's uh, that's that's been my experience too. That these these things really take time, but they do happen. I think uh, just coming back to the BWC though, and, and making that shift, um, we've seen we've seen once before, at least once before in the convention's history, that uh, a, a, it wasn't. Well, I guess you could call it a global crisis back in 2001 when we had the uh, the terrorist uh, attacks uh, on the United States on the World Trade Center, 9-11, uh, followed very soon afterwards by um, the anthrax letters incidents uh, also in the US where uh, someone was sending um, letters laced with anthrax powder to, to Congress people and, and other, several people died. But I think the, the pairing of this very uh, striking and, and unexpected and, and shocking terrorist attack on the World Trade Center uh, against the United States, coupled with this uh, demonstration that bioterrorism was a, was a real thing and could not just kill people, but also cause uh, tremendous disruption and, and panic. Um, and this, uh, perhaps as an exaggeration, called a global crisis, but it was certainly a shock. And this really uh, stunned the, I think, the BWC states parties into, into action. Um, they did, uh, nobody sort of came out and said it in so many words, but they did agree to put some of their grievances on the, the back burner for a while and cooperate together to establish both the ISU and the intercessional process uh, and to look at what could be done in terms of strengthening national implementation as a response to this terrorist threat, which had the result of putting you know, states of different political persuasions, different uh, regional and geopolitical priorities uh, onto the same side, because everyone was suddenly concerned about, about the risk of bioterrorism. And so they were much more prepared to work together and, and to you know, not make such a big deal about their, their petty, well, I shouldn't call them petty, but their differences. And uh, I'm very curious, you know, based on what we've discussed so far today, uh, whether COVID, uh, this global shock, this global crisis, will have a similar, uh, prompt a similar response from the BWC states parties. I mean, Nancy, you mentioned the uh, um, scientific review panel or the scientific uh, body to, to review scientific and technological developments. As you say, this has been uh, kicked around in the BWC for 10 years or more. Uh, perhaps now, finally, there's, there'll be enough of an impetus uh, for states parties to overcome their, their sort of squabbles about which is the best format and how to organize it and who should pay for it and all those questions which so far have, have, have meant that it hasn't hasn't come to fruition. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? And perhaps you also, Jamie, have some spoken to some um, governments about those possibilities. Sure. Oh, oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think with the sort of shift over to, from September the 11th and, and the Amerithrax attacks, I think this is a sort of strategic shock which galvanised people into action. It's not quite clear how COVID uh, will manifest, how it will affect the, the BWC this time around. I mean, one would hope that it would generate momentum, build momentum for progress in the convention, that there is also potential risk that it uh, can actually hamper proceedings and become quite acrimonious. I think that's to some extent a choice which states will have to make and how that's managed. Um, uh, just just in terms of the point was raised in the comments box and other people have mentioned this already, but the, the mindset change over time, I think, um, just to be a little bit more positive, one of the things we've started to see, not just in the unity's work, but other people as well, is that things like gender are starting to, to become more prominent. So at the, the MX5 webinar a couple of weeks ago, one of the presentations was focused on gender, um, which I think you're starting to see the sort of changing signs in the mindset, which I think is really encouraging. Um, yeah, it, it remains to be seen though exactly how, how the, the wider implications of COVID will play out, but one would hope that this would mobilize people to try and at least raise the priority and raise the, the political attention to the BWC. Um, 
Excellent. Nancy, any thoughts? Well, well I've mentioned um, uh, the Scientific Advisory Board, and I think that there will be increased um, interest around the world in, um, in increasing uh, infectious disease surveillance and reporting. I think that um, that some new some of the new developments in, for example, sequencing leading to the possibility of what is affectionately known as ubiquitous sequencing may actually uh, uh, receive increased interest and perhaps commitment to thinking about the idea of um, of following these uh, these um, crossover events in uh, in places that they seem to be um, frequently happening. I think. Um, you know, we know, for example, that there is a reassortant um, strain of flu among the pig population in um, China that China is watching very carefully and with great uh, in great detail. It's um, it's a three way combination of avian, um, human, and then a and then a a pig human. The third component is a pig human reassortant, and so this is a I know so this is a called G four. And if you're interested in G four, just Google the term G4, you know, pigs, and you'll find it. It's fascinating, and China has done an excellent job in in, in um, surveying this, in surveilling this um, this outbreak, which is across the country now, and has been shown up in other countries as well, in Europe and um, and so on. The other component is the UN, uh, the Secretary General's mechanism, which is getting increased attention because of the idea of thinking about the origin um, of not of the uh, of SARS-CoV-2, not um, uh, necessarily ca at all casting any aspersion, but you know what, where did it come from, and how much, how much can we reconstruct, and who does that? And I think the idea of of, um, of a biological laboratory network, similar to the OPCW's chemical weapons, sorry, chemical laboratory uh, network, is um, would be something to revisit. Certainly, the WHO has its uh, laboratory networks that are that are um, that are organism specific. So you know, fantastic plague laboratory network around the world that that um, identified and snuffed out a, um, a, a, a potential plague outbreak, which wouldn't be nothing like, like this. I mean, nothing like a aerosol, a viral, um, an aerosol virus pandemic, but, you know, concerning. And, um, <clears throat> and this uh, network under the auspices of, the, of WHO identified it right away and, and, and did a good job. So are there, you know, can these lab networks actually be expanded to work, um, to work, uh, somehow hand in glove with um, the efforts of the BWC to um, follow what's going on, so. Okay, well, we have um, another question from the floor, uh, which is a bit of a, it's actually quite a good question to end our discussion on because it's looking into the future. Um, and that is say, okay, we're dealing with COVID now, all the gender issues, all the public health issues, all the issues related to bioweapons and the BWC, but what's the next thing? Obviously nobody knows, but what kinds of um, global scenarios might we see in future? Would it be other outbreaks like this? I mean, we're always, like generals, always fighting the previous war and or they prepare to fight the previous war. I guess public health is to some extent the same. Uh, working out how to combat the previous outbreak. But uh, what's in the future? What are the, 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 the gendered aspects of that? How can we better prepare ourselves by looking at these uh, questions of gender that we've been discussing? Um, so just if each of you could take perhaps two or three minutes to finish off our discussion by saying, you know, what do you see coming? How can we best prepare for it? And how does gender fit into that? Can we start with you, Renata? Sure. Um, yes, I don't know what's coming <laughs> up next. <laughs> I would just like to, to say that I would, I would hope we would be learning from past crises, but for instance, if we look at Ebola and Zika, previous disease outbreaks that had very significant gendered impact, the research, uh, I, I on, on gender and Ebola and gender and Zika, I mean, the percentage of, of uh, scientific articles that actually include gender as a, a keyword when describing uh, the effects when analyzing Zika and Ebola is very minimal. Uh, we have the data for that, but I mean, it's, it's 
it's, uh, I mean, Zika, uh, I'm, I'm from Brazil and Zika was so big there and it led to so many problems of uh, women who were pregnant and looking at the scientific articles and seeing that, you know, l less than 5% include gender as, as a keyword among, it's, it's just doesn't make any sense that we are ignoring so clear gendered impacts of these diseases. So I would hope that uh, to, we, we would be better prepared for this type of thing, if we would be learning about um, the gender dynamics at play in crisis situation, in public health emergencies, and how we can amplify the voices of those who are most affected and those who are on the front line of, of the response. So um, this is to say that I wouldn't want us to miss opportunities like we've been missing to uh, understand the gendered aspects and to make sure this knowledge fits into um, decision-making processes that are based on evidence and that um, care for the needs of the people and the different segments of, of society. Um, in the field of arms control and disarmament, uh, I would be, uh, I would encourage um, member states and international organizations and academia and, and disarmament stakeholders to work together to build gender expertise inside those regimes. I think we have seen some encouraging um, aspects uh, uh, happening, for instance, in the landmine ban convention in which they assigned uh, gender focal points to each of the committee of the um, of the convention. With the chemical weapons regime, they are also, the OPCW is conducting a um, gender audit and they've been engaging with us on, on uh, several aspects related to, to gender and chemical, chemical weapons, but also chemical science. So um, I would very much uh, think that it's important to strengthen our knowledge base, and this can happen at several levels, and it can certainly happen uh, within arms control and disarmament. Okay, thank you. No, uh, no, let's go to Jamie first, and then we'll finish with Nancy. Uh, yeah, one of the things that the recent events have really brought to light is that our expectations of public health response capacities have, have rather underestimated the, the role of culture, the role of individual, the role of information, misinformation, disinformation spreading. I think that's something that the infodemic, as it has been termed, um, is something which I think was not, uh, not anticipated as being as significant as it has actually been um, in assessments to build core public health capacities. Um, the, almost the political dimension was underestimated as well. I think in the case of any biological weapons attack, you could expect that to be even more acute. Um, so you could envisage there being strategic value to misinformation and disinformation accompanying any attack. So I think this, this does put a greater premium on having technically credible and trusted communication systems, so having credible scientific and technical advice, uh, but also systems to communicate that which, which are sort of cognizant of cultural and gender differences in sort of reaching the, reaching the target audience. Um, this seems to be much more important moving forward. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, Nancy, last word for you. <coughs> My last words besides thanking everyone for the opportunity and our listener, our, the participants as well, you know, for the opportunity to have this robust discussion so the question um, said that with, uh, so we're, you know, we're in COVID, you know, we're in a pandemic finally, and we're, we've discussed public health aspects, medical aspects of, you know, how this might have, um, this, whole, this whole experience might affect arms control and uh, disarmament and so on. But then the question was, what's the next thing? And um, as Renata said, don't know, <laughs> you know, that's why it's the next thing. But I feel that, uh, that the convergence, well, that, that, that there are two major industries that are driving what could be the next thing. I think that the expansion of AI, of artificial intelligence and machine learning and its conversion with life sciences is actually uh, something that we need to keep track of. And the Biological Weapons Convention was cleverly designed so that we, we can worry not only, unfortunately, we have to worry not only about pathogens. And so the, 
the kinds of threats I think that um, may, the kinds of experiences that we may have with um, AI and robotics, for example, gender bias deep inside robotics. You know, we know that robots think like males because males design them. And this is um, interesting, fascinating, in fact, literature to follow. Um, biotech is the driver of medicine and therefore the driver of how medicine interacts with public health response and so on. We need to include biotech and the industry um, in, um, in disarmament right away. And, uh, and I know the ISU is interested in trying to do this and we're um, trying to, uh, to engage, um, engage that sector, which has um, only been, I think, uh, certainly in the margins, um, engaged sort of academically and not really as, um, as the drivers. Think of how every morning we wake up and read about the vaccines, all of us, that's what we do. What's happening with the vaccines? The CEOs of the vaccine com companies are all men, largely men, sorry. And so, you know, what does that mean? And how, again, the women are at the bench doing the designing and the men are controlling what's happening with the va vaccines. So I think incorporating um, both AI and uh, biotech into, um, into how we think about disarmament is, um, is key uh, and has not, I think, been that stress, that uh, has been stressed, has been insufficiently stressed, I think, at the BWC. And I would like to see that, that change. So who knows what's coming, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> could be G4, the new flu, but it could be, um, it could be something even more interesting and, and bizarre. Okay, but that's, thank <laughs> you all three of you for those actually very uh, impressively specific and uh, practical suggestions about how we should approach, how we should be approaching the future, even if we don't know exactly what it's gonna be throwing at us. Um, but no, I, I think we can all, uh, and I hope participants will, will join me in, in thanking you for those uh, very focused and, and thoughtful suggestions on how best to, to respond to these problems from the gender perspective, from the tech perspective, from the political and communications perspective. I mean, as, as I think Renata said, it's, it's cross-disciplinary in, in a very uh, complex way. But I hope uh, this discussion has helped all the participants uh, understand a little bit better what, uh, what's at stake, how we can do better in future, um, practical ways we can incorporate these questions into the BWC, into public health response. Um, so thank you to our panelists. That was really great. I really enjoyed uh, the discussion. Uh, thank you to all the participants. We had about 50 uh, people uh, with us. I'm sorry we couldn't hear or see you directly, but um, we certainly appreciated you joining us. Uh, and thank you very much for the, the very interesting and um, thought-provoking questions that you, you uh, put in the, in the chat panel. I hope we, we answered them satisfactorily. So we'll leave it there. It's just on 3.30, the clock ticked over. Um, happy birthday, GCSP, 25 years. It's a great uh, achievement, a great record. And we look forward to many more opportunities to, to discuss these uh, issues of global importance. Thank you all. Thank you, panelists. And see you at the next event. Bye.